Taylor Swift is one of the most famous and recognizable stars in music. Having sold over 26 million albums and 75 million digital downloads worldwide, she is one of the best-selling artists of all time. Taylor's appeal is that she really is mainstream and she's safe. You don't have to worry about what she's gonna sing about and she's relatable to all ages. As a singer-songwriter, she's brought country music to a new generation of fans. She's shown the world that country music can still produce superstars when it was looking like it couldn't. I've heard executives say that she saved country music. And those fans are as loyal and devoted to Taylor as she is to them. You know, the fact that the, fact that the fans have been there for me, you know, more and more each year, it just blows my mind. Her songs provide a deep insight into her own personal feelings and emotions, and she's not afraid to bear all in her lyrics, especially when it comes to her relationships with some of Hollywood's hottest stars. She's one of the only artists I can think of who has put her personal life so obviously into her music. Making an album is about telling stories, making confessions, and writing songs so detailed that each guy knows which song is about him, you know? It's like, they're all very personal. With a drive and ambition that saw her break through from internet sensation to worldwide superstar, she is undoubtedly the new queen of country. This is her incredible story. I never expected any of this to happen to me. I never expected to actually get to do this. So getting to play shows every night, and it's just unbelievable, and I'm so thankful every day for it. For Taylor Swift, it seems that everything she touches turns to gold. The multi-award-winning artist, adjudged to be worth a staggering $165 million, is one of the most dominant forces within modern music today. And her humble, girl-next-door attitude has made her a huge hit with the fans. But how did it all begin for one of America's most cherished sweethearts? Taylor Swift, known as America's Sweetheart, really did have very much an idyllic American childhood. I mean, she grew up on a Christmas tree farm in rural Pennsylvania with a very close family unit. Her dad's a stockbroker. She has one brother, Austin. Taylor has said repeatedly her mom is her best friend. So this is a very close family unit. She grew up, I guess you could say it's a pretty middle class life. And she had the typical well-to-do lifestyle, you know, riding horses, nice country style life the usual kind of nice, typical American lifestyle for the middle class, wealthy kids. So that was her beginnings. It became apparent from a young age that Taylor was a very creative and artistic youngster. Taylor was a child prodigy. There is no other way to put it. She was so immensely talented from such a young age. Like any teenage girl, it was, you know, dance and acting and creative arts. She was, she was always very creative, evidently. She was always writing in a journal, always being a very arty kind of kid. She wrote poetry, for example, this incredible poem called Monster in My Closet when she was nine. And actually, just a couple of years later, she even wrote a 350-page novel, which remains unpublished to this day. But Taylor's first and strongest passion was music, an interest she did not inherit from her white-collar parents. Taylor has said herself that at the age of four, her parents would take her to see Disney movies, and she would come back and know the soundtrack verbatim, be able to sing every song word for word. In fact, she said it really freaked her parents out. But, you know, I think from an early age, Taylor knew where her passion and her ability lay, and she was not going to miss out on that. Her talent was just incredible for someone of her age, and incredibly, it was actually the computer repairman who ended up teaching her how to play four chords on the guitar and look at where she's ended up from that. And obviously she then did something that most middle class young girls weren't doing, which is become obsessed by music. Not just obsessed as a fan, but obsessed by um, making it her career from a very early age, which is what I think made her different to anyone else. Having learned some basic guitar skills, Taylor progressed rapidly and put her energy into songwriting. By the time she attended high school, she was quickly carving out her own style, but this didn't go down well with her peers, and she was often left out, teased, or at worst, bullied. You can actually see that in her music as, you, as she goes through writing her songs, that she's always felt kind of an outsider, I think, because she wasn't like all the other girls in her class. 
She wasn't the mathlete or the athlete. She was kind of a tall, lanky girl with frizzy hair who liked nothing better than to sit with her notebooks and write songs. Taylor has been quite open, actually, about how she was bullied at school. She didn't want to be one of those girls who would go out, sneak some naughty alcoholic drinks and party hard into the night. That was never her thing. She wasn't like all the other girls in her class. And while they were going to the teenage parties, she was in the karaoke bar trying a new song out. Um, in high school, I never got invited to the cool parties. And from what I hear, this is the coolest party. So I'm really stoked to be here. And then as her music talent developed, actually, she wanted to be out singing at music festivals and that sort of thing. So as a result, she never really fit in at school. And some of her most powerful songs have actually come from talking about that time, like 15, for example. Fifteen tells a cautionary tale of teenage heartbreak and was based on real events that happened to both Taylor and her friend Abigail in their freshman year at high school. Taylor has been asked many times, how do you write your songs? How do you come up with your lyrics? And she has herself said, look, go to high school and write about it. And that's basically what she's done. You know, she started out with a very typical teenage girl's life, I think, and then veered off to something very unusual and very different and very driven. But Taylor very quickly uh, was moved into superstardom. Uh, even you know, at the age most girls are picking out a senior prom dress, she was attending the Grammys and winning. Taylor's strong interest in music took her in a surprising direction. Although her hometown of Wyomissing, Pennsylvania, resides close to Philadelphia on the east coast of the United States, she was drawn heavily to the sound of country music. Pennsylvania has very rural areas, so for her to be into country isn't that unusual. At that point in time, country music was probably even bigger than it is now. When you think about women like Shania Twain or Faith Hill or the Dixie Chicks, I think those are people that Taylor studied. She's, she's got to learn from them. It's the same sort of way with like a Dolly Parton. You can make a lot of comparisons between what she's doing at this point in her career and what Dolly was doing at a similar place in her career. With the influence of these heavyweights of country music finding their way into Taylor's output, one artist stood head and shoulders above the rest when it came to inspiring the young singer, and that was Shania Twain. Shania Twain was her hero, heroine. Taylor has said her major musical influence is Shania Twain, uh, that kind of combination of pop and country music. Also, Shania has a very glamorous look and a lot of fun with her videos, and I think Taylor likes that. The other thing is Shania sings a lot about real life, what she's gone through herself, very honest and open ballads, and I think Taylor resonates with that as well. Depending on where you come from in the, the realm of is it country or is it not country, some will say that Shania was never country. I personally think she was. And I think Taylor Swift saw that kind of career um, and how Shania had done her own thing to some extent um, and wanted to emulate that. I think she, she loved that music. It was that hybrid of country and pop, which I'm sure appealed to a teenager. And um, you know the whole glamour of Shania and I think the, the sheer level of her success at that point was what you know drove her on to say, well, I can do that. And Taylor certainly could do exactly that. Songwriting took a hold of the 11-year-old who quickly poured her so far brief life experience into the music she began to create. And with the support of her parents, she was soon taking her first real steps to success. From a very early age, Taylor clearly had the family wrapped around her little finger because she persuaded her parents to take her for long drives into New York to audition for off-Broadway shows and even take her every month down to Nashville so she could try and meet with agents and recording artists and songwriters. And this was from the age of like 11 or 12. Uh, she had persuaded them to do this. With a demo tape made up of karaoke songs, Taylor would spend these visits to Nashville approaching as many labels in town as possible in an effort to get noticed. She would walk down the street in Nashville and she would go from door to door, knocking on the doors and go, hi, I'm Taylor, I write songs, um, would you give me a deal? For the most part, she would meet a secretary and maybe leave one of her tapes and, you know, went back home and nothing happened. But she started getting her name out there. Maybe being so young, it wasn't so daunting. Maybe it was just a case of, this is fun for the family to do that. Um, the fact that it then became real and she got offered deals, I'm sure she didn't realize how 
difficult that was, and there's people who've been here 10 years knocking on doors trying to do the same thing. But when you come to town the first couple of times and people show an interest in you, clearly you don't know that that's not supposed to happen. Realizing the importance of the town for anyone who wanted to make it in country music, and with mounting interest in their prodigious youngster, Taylor's parents took the bold and supportive step of moving the whole family to Nashville. Anybody that wants to be a country singer has to come through Nashville. You don't have to always live in Nashville once you've become a successful country singer, but it's almost impossible to do it without living here at some point. Ultimately, Taylor actually convinced her parents to pick up sticks out of Pennsylvania and move to Nashville when she was only a teenager because she was so determined and, and had such a strong belief in herself that she was in fact going to be a star. What it shows as well is just that incredible faith that her parents had in Taylor's talent. They believed in her. They were never pushy. This was always driven by Taylor, not them. But they knew that it was a risk that was worth taking. They were pretty sure that they had something special in Taylor, and so it just kind of made sense to help her pursue her dream by coming to Nashville. If you want to learn the craft of country songwriting, this is, the, this is the school right here. This is the university. This is the graduate level learning program. Moving to Nashville proved to be a turning point in Taylor's ambitions, as she found that the biggest names and labels in the industry were now right on her doorstep. Nashville is where the talent is centralized. You've got more, especially if you're into country, you've got more songwriters here than you've got anywhere else. The record labels are here, the producers are here, the other singers are here, the whole industry is here. And so if you wanna start meeting the people that you need to know to put together a successful team to make you the kind of star that you wanna be, you gotta be in Nashville. I spent that entire time trying to get a record deal and um, actually moved to Nashville when I was 13 and. It, didn't get a record deal right away. But Taylor was nothing if not tenacious in her efforts to land a deal, a quality she retains even to this day. Taylor has a sign in her tour bus that says never ever give up and I think that really does kind of epitomize who she is and what she believes today. You don't get to be a multi-million pound recording artist like Taylor is at the age of 21 without that kind of belief. I think from the very beginning, you know, despite getting turned down in Nashville month after month after month, Taylor never gave up, her parents never gave up on her, and really, it paid off. Then finally, at the age of 14, Taylor landed an artist development deal with RCA Records. She was paired with various Music Row writers, including Troy Virgis, Brett Beavers, Brett James, and Mac McAnally, before she finally found her perfect collaborator in Liz Rose with whom she would form a lasting and successful partnership. And while Taylor's young age appeared to surprise several industry insiders, Rose immediately saw her ability was far beyond her years. Jody Williams, who at that time was Liz Rose's uh, song publisher, he said something to Liz like, why are you wasting your time with this 14-year-old kid? And Liz said to him, she pulls her own weight. In a songwriting session, she's no kid that even at age 14, she was committed to developing her craftsmanship, her songwriting, to the level of an adult. When I moved to Nashville, I had, I had so many heroes that were artists that got up on a stage every night, but my most ultimate heroes were the songwriters of Nashville. The people who wrote the hooks that got stuck in your head, those were the people that I wanted to meet. At 14 years old, she's there writing songs and interacting with other songwriters and learning the craft and really finding out how you put a song together, uh, what makes a hit, what doesn't make a hit. And she gets lots of experience doing this. Taylor's experience with RCA brought her to the attention of Sony ATV Tree Publishing, and she was offered a deal. I think a real breakthrough came for me in my songwriting career when I was 14. And I was given a publishing deal um, by Sony ATV in Nashville, and they really took a chance on me. That I was the youngest person they ever signed. So um, I'd been writing since I was 12 years old, and 
when I was 14, I really started to co-write around Nashville, and um, it was really, really fun because I'd been writing by myself. Um, and getting, getting involved in the whole songwriting community in Nashville really helped me along and helped me on my way to you know, becoming an artist. Taylor quickly displayed her natural ability. Now encouraged to exercise her passion in songwriting, she proceeded, under the guidance of Liz Rose, to pour her emotions onto the page. You know, you have to remember, Taylor Swift is a tremendous songwriter. She has written more than 200 songs in her very short lifetime. She wrote all the songs on her last two albums, and the appeal of Taylor Swift, in addition to her voice, in addition to her image, is the fact that she really is singing from the heart about what she knows. And she does write for her audience, primarily of teenage girls who were in high school who are going through the same things. But the themes of her music, like, you know, heartbreak, love, uh, disappointment, romance, having a great day with your mom. These are things that everyone can relate to of all ages. What's different about Taylor Swift now and then is that she started out as a journal writer. And you can read her journals on her old MySpace pages. And she was a journal writer. I mean, in the old days, she'd have been a diarist. So her songs are basically her diaries. I think there are many country writers who in their earlier years are diarists. Loretta Lynn comes to mind, who certainly wrote exactly what she was experiencing. Early Dolly Parton is about her poverty and her childhood. And the fact that she was writing from a teenager's perspective was what was different, because there hadn't been prior to her a child writer, a teen writer, who wrote from a teen perspective in country music, and that, I think, was what set her apart. Songwriting is an escape. It's an escape from the reality where you have to say the exact right thing at the exact right time. Um, because for me, a lot of my songs are confessions of love, or confessions of sadness, or confessions of loneliness or frustration. And um, I'm not excellent at saying those things in the right moment when they happen in real life. But I can say it in a song. I think the bigger problem with a young songwriter is that they're gonna try to write things that they don't know. They're gonna try to write the experiences that they've heard on the radio but haven't actually experienced themselves. For Taylor to come along and be able to be honest enough about what she was feeling, to be able to, to get it out there for everybody else to hear, that's pretty rare. And I think that's what people like Liz Rose really latched onto, was that willingness to be so honest about her own life. Honesty combined with a clear vision of her future had a huge part to play for Taylor. RCA wanted to mold the 15-year-old into a country singer who performed other people's material. But this went against what she had envisaged for herself, and in an incredibly daring move, Taylor stepped away from the deal. To take that opportunity, which anybody would kill for, a development deal at a major record company like RCA, and basically say, no, I'm, this isn't for me, it's not working, this isn't what I want, is jaw-dropping. It showed that Taylor didn't just want to be famous. Most people come to town, they'll do whatever it takes to be successful. Nashville is essentially a songwriter's town. The publishing industry runs this city, and um, artists are supposed to sing the songs that the writers write. You know, for Taylor, she wanted to be on a record label, but she didn't want to do other people's songs. She wanted to have a publishing deal, but she didn't want other people to do her songs. All along, it hasn't been about just being famous and she was willing to give up pretty much a sure thing to do things the way that she wanted to do them. The kid had ice water in her veins. She just knew what she wanted, and she had a very, very astonishing sense of self. But Taylor made the decision to leave, and actually not being a, with a major record company has been one of the most important parts of her career. But Taylor wasn't finished yet. Whilst performing a showcase at the famous Bluebird Cafe in town, she came to the attention of record executive Scott Borchetta. She was just doing a little performance at the Bluebird Cafe, which is a local songwriting venue in Nashville where a lot of country performers would go and sing. It's where Garth Brooks was discovered way back when, so because he was discovered there, 
Everyone who comes to town wants to play at the Bluebird. Obviously, Taylor Swift had talent. Borchetta was in the audience. He recognised it. Whether anyone else would have recognised it, I don't know. Having just started his own label, Big Machine Records, Borchetta was immediately impressed with Taylor's talent and made her an offer she couldn't refuse. Scott Borchetta said, OK, I want you to do your songs, and I'll let you be involved in the process. What he allowed her to do was always have full control of her music. So he was a real nurturing force. He believed in her. He was always prepared to basically fulfill Taylor's vision. But without Scott, Taylor would never have had that incredible success. To see the stardom there when probably, I, I bet there was no other record executive in town who saw what he saw. I, I'm sure it wasn't lost on him that there wasn't really anybody who was singing directly to this audience. A teenage audience wasn't a big part of country music at that point. And um, she tapped into this. What's key about Scott and Taylor finding each other is that you had two people looking to do something really new, both looking to make a name for themselves, and both being as driven as the other person. And so that's, that's a very combustible and unstoppable combination. The pair wasted no time, and Swift released her first single, Tim McGraw, in June 2006, which quickly brought her into the limelight. It's a song about the teenage breakup, that she's, she's going to have to break up with her boyfriend because they're parting, he's going to college, I think. And it's a song about how they'll remember each other, and they'll remember each other because of Tim McGraw on the radio. It kind of fits into one of the main themes of contemporary country over the last 10 or 15 years or so, which is that notion of romantic nostalgia. What made Taylor's record different was that relationship was very fresh. You were talking a matter of maybe two months, not looking back to something 20 years ago. It was very clever. I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but very clever to name drop Tim McGraw in a debut single. <laughs> Um, who at the time was huge, he still is, but then he was really huge. I think it probably actually was Tim McGraw that she was writing about, um, or Tim McGraw songs that she was writing about, but I think she was also aware that this would be another way to make that song stick. And it was a good song, and it, it, it gave everyone an insight to the mind and the, and the heart of a teenage girl going through high school. It certainly set her up as, as, as being able to write about her own life. Taylor worked hard to promote the single, and as a self-confessed child of the internet, she utilized social media websites in order to build her fan base. One of the interesting things about Tim McGraw was that it took radio a while to catch on to what was going on. MySpace was really kind of at its peak about the time that Tim McGraw hits, and so people had a way to listen to the song that didn't involve waiting to hear it on the radio. So she was building an audience the whole time that that song was around, whether radio was playing it or not. It sped up the country music charts, so she was already marked at that stage as a real country star on the rise. But what was incredible is that with that first single, Taylor managed to cross over onto the pop charts almost instantly. It had a major impact on Nashville because at that point, the record business here was in slump mode. It was not doing well. Um, I've heard executives say that she saved country music. While Tim McGraw became a global hit, 16-year-old Taylor didn't let up, launching her self-titled debut album only a few months after. Released in October 2006, the record was seen as a real-time account of her teenage years, with songs that featured a cathartic blend of nostalgia, raw emotion, and honesty. I think Taylor Swift took everyone by surprise with that first album. There were so many hits on the album, and as one song would go straight to number one, another one was coming out. What people didn't realize is that Taylor had actually been writing songs for years by the time she became famous. Since she was like 12 or 13, she had all these notebooks with songs. With that album, Taylor tapped in to a market that country music doesn't always get, which is teenage girls. And I think that album more maybe than any of the rest of them is really, it was, you know, it, was, it was an album by a teenage girl for teenage girls. One of the biggest hits from the album was Teardrops on My Guitar, a track for Taylor that clearly came from the heart. Here's a reason for the teardrops on my guitar. The I wrote it about 
a situation that I went through when I was in high school when I sat next to this guy in class and I had the biggest crush on him and he had no idea. Every single day he would come in and sit down and talk to me about his girlfriend and uh, I got sick and tired of it one day and so I wrote this song about it and um, well needless to say I'm guessing the secret's out at this point. One of the things that Taylor does well, and, and this may be one of the lessons that she learned from people like Shania Twain and Faith Hill and the Dixie Chicks, is that she knows how to write and produce country music that appeals to people that don't necessarily consider themselves country fans. Taylor is essentially a songwriter first and foremost, and I think that's allowed her to spread her wings and have credibility. You know, she may be very young, but she still experiences life, love, and disappointment the way the rest of us do. And despite the fact that people may be a lot older or from different cultures or different perspectives, I think she really gets to the heart of what all of us feel in those situations. Hence, her incredible mainstream and widespread appeal. With follow-up singles Our Song, Picture to Burn, and Shoulda Said No selling in their millions, the album was declared a smash hit, and Taylor Swift had been introduced to the world in spectacular style. Her first album just kept selling and selling, and they kept having more um, hit singles off it, which was a surprise, I mean, especially with a debut album. It started small. It was, it was not one of those debut albums that comes out and is at number one on the charts and then kind of falls. It was a build and a build and a build and a build. And it, you know, and it kept selling over several years and is still putting up, you know, one or 2,000 units every week. So people are still discovering that first album. I'm just hoping that, you know, I have a second album that does as well as the first and, you know, someday get to be a headliner and always be the same person that I started out as. Little did Taylor know that her wishes for a successful second record were about to be granted. In November 2008 came the follow-up album that would send her into the stratosphere, Fearless. Before it came out, we got together she insisted on playing some things for me and she had her iPod there and she's zipping through and go, okay, you gotta hear this one. So I got a preview of it and was impressed by the amount of growth that, that I heard from, you know, two years before. Uh, you could hear now what she was writing about when she was 15 and 16 very, and still in high school, very different than 17 and 18. Now she's, you know, getting up out into the world. She had done so well, she had toured heavily. She'd promoted herself, she'd been on TV every week, she was everywhere. Really, the only question was whether she could have as good a material as the first album. A lot of times you, you expect sort of a sophomore slump with the second album. One of the reasons for that is people say, you've got your entire life to write your first album, you have six months to write the second one. Her prolific ability as a songwriter is a big part of what uh, led to her ultimate superstardom. And she did it. She had the songs. She was still writing from the perspective of an ordinary girl. She wasn't writing songs about being in hotel rooms and going to the Grammys. She wasn't doing that. She never fell for that trap of writing about being a star, which obviously you can't relate to. And she kept herself grounded as an artist, even though her lifestyle changed drastically. The first single from Fearless was called Love Story. And that song was the song that really catapulted her to superstar status all around the world. Love Story is kind of universal. It's you know, it's pop and it's country. It's uh, you know it's Ro it's a retelling of Romeo and Juliet. It kind of taps into those sort of primal romance stories. It's really kind of that fantasy that so many young girls want to live out. I think to this day it's considered her biggest crossover hit. It was a real pop song. They did a pop remix of it. And from that day, really, Taylor Swift was a force to be reckoned with on the charts. Written following a row with her parents, Taylor projected her feelings onto the story of Romeo and Juliet. After this whole blow up with, with her parents, she runs into her room and writes a song and said, at that moment, I completely identified with everything about Romeo and Juliet, except the part where they both die. So why can't it have a happy ending? And she gave it a happy ending and had a great ending for her because it turned into a huge hit. 
But it's also a song that's so catchy that you don't have to be a young girl to like it. That's when I went, oh, this really is a for real songwriter. That was the record that really brought me around. For this record, she uh, co-produced it. Two got co-producing um, credit with Nathan Chapman, who had produced the first one, showing that she's really the creative force behind all elements of the music that she's making. And no, this isn't a kid. No, this isn't a one-hit wonder. No, this isn't a novelty act. This is an artist. Fearless sold in its millions and received worldwide critical acclaim, not just for song quality, but also the slew of hits that it spawned. And while Taylor had grown musically, she had also garnered global attention and success, all while still at the tender age of 19. I never imagined that the unattainable thing that I had always held in my mind and my imagination would happen to me at 19. Um, I couldn't be more grateful, but I love a challenge. And right now the challenge is to find that next challenge. Although Taylor's talent clearly lies at the heart of her achievements, the shrewd marketing strategy of Big Machine Records has allowed her to shine. Scott Borchetta has always looked after things very carefully. He's done some really clever commercial deals as well. In 2008, they released an exclusive EP via Walmart, obviously a massive retailer in America. When you sign an exclusive with Walmart, you get displays in the store, your, your album, your cardboard cutout is put out. Um, she was doing, I think she did a, um, like, a closed circuit TV performance where that was shown only in Walmart. So if you wanted to see this thing and you're a Taylor Swift fan, you had to go down to your Walmart store and, and watch this. Along with physical marketing campaigns, Taylor's focus has very much included digital and online sources. For many years, she's been part of the growing trend in social media, using it to connect with her fans and build an audience, making her a true pioneer in that arena and increasing her worldwide popularity. Even now, she has amassed over 41 million likes on Facebook and has 26 million followers on Twitter. Taylor Swift's use of MySpace, Twitter, all of these uh, new media avenues does make her the first of a probably a new kind of artist. She was a child of the social media age. So she was just doing what she'd have been doing, whether she was an artist or not. She was doing her blogs. She was writing what she was going on in her life sharing it with the world. So she wasn't doing anything radical as far as she was concerned, but she was in terms of how you market an artist because now everybody does it. She will go down in history as the gal who held the beacon up and said, this is the way to go. And the industry follows. Taylor Swift's presence online has led to her becoming one of the most downloaded artists in history. Taylor Swift has sold an awful lot of music. In fact, in addition to all of her albums, she is one of the top downloaded artists of all time. Uh, I think her songs are very catchy and also have the advantage of appearing in a lot of movie soundtracks and TV shows like Grey's Anatomy, which appeal to a very broad fan base. In 2008, as part of the CMT Crossroads series, which paired country music stars with artists of other genres, Taylor Swift performed a show with British rock stalwarts, Def Leppard. Performing the track Hysteria for Taylor had a country connection as it was produced by Mutt Lang, husband of her idol, Shania Twain. And in a bizarre twist, Def Leppard happened to be her mother's favorite band. I think it did seem to a lot of people like an odd couple pairing, but again, for her, this was you know her mother's favorite group, and of course her mom is going to say, absolutely, you can do this project, and it made sense to her. She's born a Def Leppard fan because of her parents, and so she's, she's not our music, she, she, she could crawl. I think she saw herself as one day being, you know, an arena um, headliner, and that's what Def Leppard is, was all about. It was about going out there and playing to lots of people, getting them to stand up, cheer, and sing along with your catchy choruses. As a band who've been through the mill themselves, they understood that here was a kid that had talent and could write a good song. Um, and their career has been based on good pop songs too. So there's a connection there. And, um, you know, two different worlds, two different generations, but somehow I think it worked very well. We just thought it was a great opportunity to do something just different. 
It brought out the uh, pop side of her a little bit more. But of course, um, Def Leppard are, uh, you know, to country fans, they're out there. So it gave her a, 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 an ability to say, look, I'm not just a country singer. You know, I, I have interest in other types of music. With Fearless topping the charts, Taylor embarked on her first headline tour in 2009. And given the hype surrounding the singer, there was a great deal of pressure on the young girl from Pennsylvania. Fearless is her first headlining tour, so that's the first time that she's carrying all the weight herself. You know, before, she's touring with Brad Paisley or Tim McGraw and Faith Hill or whoever, and she's just, she's sort of the icing on the cake. Once you go headline, everything's on your shoulders. I always expected to have to do a lot of stressing out about selling tickets. And then I went on my first headlining tour and everything just sold out. And I was like, really, this is how this works? She came to Nashville on the Fearless Tour right as the voting for the CMA Awards was opening up. And so there were a lot of people that went into that show going, all right, let's see what you got, prove it to me. And I distinctly remember people coming out of that show going, wow. She puts on a really good show. So what's the show for? You know, it's entertainment and it's about emotion and you can't falter for that. And that, that tour was all about emotion. Taylor has said, you know, the dream of her life, what drove her all the way through her childhood was the idea of being on stage and having people in the audience singing every word of her song back to her. And she said recently that that started to happen where she sings and she hears the audience singing everything with her. It means a lot to her. That was her dream. And that was the focus of all those lonely years uh, trying to make it in Nashville that kept her going. I've never expected that kind of success. I've never just felt entitled to my shows selling out or things like this happening to me, but the fact that they have happened to me has been wonderful. While the Fearless Tour marked her first headlining series of shows, throughout her career, Taylor has gained a reputation for being a dynamic and exciting live performer. She is so great when she's doing a full set. She puts everything into it. She has the audience eating out of the palm of her hands. People forget what a brilliant musician she is, and she can be really rocky, actually. She gets into those shows, and actually, she feels most comfortable when she's on stage. My favorite performance that I've done on an award show was definitely the Rain performance that I did on the ACMs. You know, I thought of that performance when I was in middle school, sitting in class. A lot of the ideas that I've gotten to live out on this tour are from me being in school just thinking, hey, you know, what would I do if I ever got to perform on an award show? Probably it's never going to happen, but what, what would I do if I ever got the chance? And so I remember one day I was sitting there and I was like, wouldn't it be cool if it was just an entire thunderstorm, rainstorm on stage? By the conclusion of the tour, Fearless had surpassed all expectation, and Taylor Swift was a fully formed superstar. The album just performed, I think, beyond everybody's wildest dreams, and it's ended up, it's sold almost nine million albums at a time where nothing sells nine million albums anymore. I mean, you could make an argument that for its time, it was the biggest album ever in country music, certainly something that would rival Shania Twain or Garth Brooks at their peak, at times when albums were selling more, I think Taylor was as big a star as any of them ever were. At the 2008 Grammys, Taylor narrowly lost out to Amy Winehouse in being crowned Best New Artist. However, in 2010, she scooped four Grammys, including Album of the Year for Fearless. Thank you so much. Can you help with that? <laughs> no, I think I'm gonna carry them as long as they'll let me have them. This is the dream come true. It's, um, it's like I've never been presumptuous about dreams. And um, when you have crazy dreams, like I wonder what it would be like to win a Grammy someday, I, I never actually could fathom that it might happen until I was walking up there 
and winning one. I, I'm going to celebrate for the rest of my life. Thank you so much, you guys. And the accolades didn't stop there, as a whole raft of awards soon followed, making Fearless the most honored country music album in history. Taylor herself would go on to pick up numerous nominations and trophies, one of which was the coveted Country Music Association Award for Entertainer of the Year in 2009. I remember when she won the CMA Awards and she got up after the Entertainer of the Year Award was announced and said, everything that I have ever wanted has all come true tonight. And, and you know, I asked her backstage that night, I was like, okay, so now what are you gonna do? You've achieved everything you wanted at 19. And just like, you know, basically it's like, well, I guess I'll have to come up with some new things. <laughs> but Taylor admits that she couldn't have had the success she enjoys if it wasn't for the dedication of her behind the scenes crew. Honestly, I owe so much of of that Entertainer of the Year Award to the people who set up that stage every night and uh, the people behind the scenes who are taking calls and sending emails and know how to work a fax machine. You know, those, those people are gonna be the ones that I spend time with tonight and uh, jump up and down and hug nonstop. Award ceremonies haven't all been plain sailing for Taylor. A bizarre incident occurred during the 2009 VMA Awards when Kanye West dramatically stormed the stage during her acceptance speech for winning Best Female Video, claiming R&B singer Beyonce should have won. Kanye West made a, a real fool of himself. Here comes Taylor to receive a very well-deserved reward, and he gets up and makes an absolute idiot of himself, rambling about Beyonce, who looked horrified in the audience. He was not doing her any favors either. Drunk Kanye West gets up, starts talking about how she didn't deserve the award and how Beyonce had made one of the greatest videos of all time. And Taylor just kind of goes into movie star pose. She just sort of stands there and pulls back a little bit, looked very Katharine Hepburn. It was so fascinating because it really galvanized the groundswell of Taylor Swift fans who were outraged on her behalf and her poor treatment. And you have this kind of angry guy, you know, shoving this young girl away from the microphone. I mean, it was really horrible to see. I mean, here was a 300 pound gorilla stomping on a baby kitten and everybody in the world saw that for what it was. I felt terrible for her. I felt awful. It was it definitely a TV moment that you won't forget. You just thought, oh my goodness, it was, I mean, people were so mad. And her response to it made it appear all the more repugnant because she dealt with it with such grace and class. I think that's one of those places where she kind of grew up in the public eye. She never really criticized Kanye, who basically went into hiding after the incident because he had embarrassed himself so badly and ended up apologizing uh, profusely on Twitter uh, for really uh, offending not just Taylor, but really a lot of her fans. It's, it just spoke worlds about the difference between the culture that produces a Kanye West and the culture that produces a Taylor Swift certainly made her a lot of points in the country world because not only did she come out of that looking very good, but afterwards she made a point of going on and, and accepting one of the awards and talking about how she was a country singer winning an MTV award. I think that at that point in her career, it couldn't have, you couldn't have scripted it any better as a PR person. Taylor released her third album, Speak Now, in October 2010, with high expectations following the staggering success of Fearless for the country pop artist. One of the things that's impressive about Speak Now is how well it did. There was a lot of anticipation in how would this go over? Would she be able to you know, sustain these incredible sales that she's had before? Well, first week she sold more than a million copies, which had not been done since Lil Wayne put a record out, and it, she, hers actually sold more than his, sold more than any album since 50 Cent five and a half years ago, when a lot of things were very different in the record business. I think for, for most people it would be daunting, but I don't think it was daunting for Taylor Swift because she's just carried on doing what she does. She writes songs from the heart, she knows what she's doing, she knows what works. Um, she's honest, the songs have integrity. Speak Now is really her young adult album. Uh, the, the lyrics, the songs are much more mature and that's not something 
that's easy to do for an artist that started out with as young an audience as Taylor did. I got to get a little preview of it. I was the only journalist allowed into the studio with her while she was recording it. And I, I wanted to see uh, how she works creatively behind uh, the mixing board to see her develop the overall sound of her records. And she was so jazzed uh, to hear the orchestra playing her music. It's just a culmination of her talents. It's just, you can see the pattern within those albums as she grows and gets better as a as an artist and a lyricist, it's, it's from the heart, and she's good at it. It's really an album that showed that she had the potential to, to become more than just kind of a one-trick pony. Speak Now debuted at number one on the Billboard chart and was supported by strong critical reviews. The album's success, combined with her previous two offerings, confirmed Taylor's global appeal. Oh my God! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what? So Taylor, on behalf of Big Machine Records and our partners, Universal Music Group Worldwide, we are so proud to present to you this plaque that indicates you have sold more than 20 million records worldwide. <laughs> The number 20 million to me is just such a high number that I never ever imagined that, that uh, selling that many records could happen to me. Because it's something that happens to you. You know, you, you make an album and it could either sell 20 copies or 20 million. You make an album that could either um, go platinum and, or it could sell 12 copies and it's up to the fans to decide what the certification of a, a record is. So it's, it's something that's just happened to me. and. Um, I'm so happy that it did. Speak Now would continue Taylor's autobiographical songwriting style, which, as always, contains nods or direct links to her romantic relationships. I, I've been writing it for the last two years, so this summer it's all about just the finishing touches and getting in there in the studio and like recording the last couple of songs. What do you write about? Thanks, you guys. Oh, what do you think? Boys in love. <laughs> Look, she is undoubtedly now one of the most eligible stars in Hollywood, and she has had so many high profile, I say relationships, but they've never quite got to that stage. They've been at the dating stage, but look, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal, Joe Jonas, of course, John Mayer, even Zac Efron, one of the most eligible men in Hollywood. In recent years, Taylor has also been linked with the likes of Twilight star Taylor Lautner, One Direction's Harry Styles, and even grandson of former U.S. Senator Robert Kennedy, Connor Kennedy. However, America's sweetheart has no problem putting her feelings into music, especially if the relationship didn't end well. Making an album is about telling stories, making confessions, and writing songs so detailed that each guy knows which song is about him, you know? It's like they're all very personal. Taylor knows who her fans are, and she doesn't see any reason uh, not to be 100% honest about what she's been through. One of the ways that she does that is about writing very openly about the way that she feels about things, to the point of even naming people in songs. Uh, one of her early songs was called Hey Steven. That's a guy that's in a country duo called Love and Theft. You know, you hear it on Speak Now, there's Dear John song, you know, she was dating John Mayer. Um, about a very, you know, egocentric guy, and, you know, she, she disses and dishes. When Joe Jonas dumped her on a, in a 27-second phone call, she talked about it on Ellen DeGeneres and sang about it in her music. And obviously, her message to me at that point to spread to all of her future boyfriends was that, I'm not gonna talk about you, but what I will do, if you treat me bad, is write a song about you. And that's obviously her incredible power. But Taylor doesn't reserve her musical backlash only for former boyfriends. Taylor recorded a song called Mean, You're So Mean, and, and she's singing to someone who's basically just told her she can't really sing. I think that she was just hurt by the endless criticism of her vocals, and that was the culmination of it, that was the high point, and she'd had enough and she wanted to say something. I'm Taylor. Having been dogged over the years by various disparaging comments regarding her vocal skills, many speculated that Mean was aimed at critic Bob Lefsitz after he wrote a scathing review of Taylor's ill-fated Grammy performance with rock legend Stevie Nicks. I never got her to admit that it was about Bob Lefsitz, but I'm pretty sure that it was about Bob Lefsitz. I, I was sure enough that I called Bob Lefsitz and was like, you need to hear this song because I think it's about you. <laughs> I 
don't know whether it was directed specifically at him. I mean, he's a, a great commentator, and he says what he thinks just like she does, so there's an interesting parallel there. Why you gotta be so mean? In the words, it's something like, you know, I'm gonna end up on tour, and you're gonna be stuck still where you are right now, and you're so mean. And I love the fact that Taylor uses her music to kind of fight back and either defend herself or stand her ground against those who are less than kind to her. She told me at that time, never treat anybody badly who writes songs because they'll have the last word. Having debuted at the top of the U.S. charts and accompanied by strong worldwide sales and rave reviews, Speak Now was another huge success for the country star. Reaching out to her global fan base, she supported the album with a massive Speak Now world tour, which lasted for 13 months and allowed Taylor to experience many different nations and cultures across the world, including a two-month leg across Asia and Europe. Going on tour for two months in, um, in Asia and then Europe has been such a life-changing experience because um, looking back to before this tour, there were so many things that I didn't know, so many things that I hadn't experienced yet, cultures I hadn't um, been a part of yet. It's like getting to go into these countries and experience the way that they live their lives and they do their thing, and it's like, uh, it's a privilege. And that's the way that my band and I have always looked at this and the way we've always looked at world travel. Getting to go out of our comfort zone is a privilege. Finishing the tour in Europe uh, at the O2 Arena in London with a sold out show is, um, I couldn't think of a more perfect way to end this European run. I've gotten to experience just parts of the world I never thought I'd get to see. And nonetheless, play shows in and have the crowds singing the words back to me. As a songwriter, to have people singing the lyrics back to you in countries where they don't even really speak English, it's like it's so gratifying. It just, it's been a really beautiful tour. And through all her success, Taylor never forgets her loyal and devoted fans. Not only does she adore them, but she remains humble and attempts to involve them in her world as much as possible. So when I was a little kid and uh, I would see singers on TV playing concerts or music videos and stuff. I, I would always think to myself, if, if I was ever lucky enough by some crazy, crazy chance I could ever do that, I would want to sign autographs all day, every day for anybody who wanted one. And I'd want to take pictures with everybody. And, you know, I just, I wanted to say thank you for all the stuff that they've done for me, you know? They've made my life really fun. The fans have just absolutely made me feel like I've won the lottery of dreams coming true. Um, when I'm up there and I look down and I see all of these t-shirts that people have made and um, the signs that they make are hilarious. You know, the fact, that, the fact that the fans have been there for me, you know, more and more each year, it just blows my mind. And while conquering the music world is a full-time job for Taylor, She's also managed to divert her attentions to the acting sphere, appearing in shows like Hannah Montana, lending her voice to animated features like The Lorax, and sharing the big screen with some of the top names in Hollywood in films such as comedy, Valentine's Day. I was really interested when I saw that Taylor took the part in Valentine's Day because she was still pretty early in her singing career and it does show you that she does have ambition and could do other things, you know. She was a really good actress in that film and I definitely think in the future she could do more movies. And obviously what was very interesting about that role is it led to one of her relationships with Taylor Lautner who was the big star of the moment through the Twilight movie franchise and they had an on-screen relationship but by all accounts also got very close off-screen and went on a few dates as well. She's clearly talented. She's got a she got a knack for it. She's good on screen. Um, I think she's a natural performer. I think if she was offered a, a major role in something, she might consider it. TV and movies are a nice nice little aside and a perk of the job. But music is too important for her to I think let that go. And Taylor has no intention of letting her music go. In October 2012, she released her fourth studio album, Red. Heading straight to number one, it broke many records along the way and outstripped Garth Brooks' Double Lives to gain the highest one-week sales of a country album ever. 
And while the album would offer a more edgy sound and diverse tone, lead single We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together presented fans with an accessible and fun path into her new work. In a lot of ways, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together is very much an old Taylor. It's thematically, it's very much a throwback to those early ex-boyfriend songs. Production-wise, in terms of the sound of the record, it's, it's very different. Um, it's the first album track that she's ever done where it wasn't just her and her producer Nathan Chapman, where she's working with Max Martin and Shellback out of Sweden. And you know, those are the guys that make those big dance pop records. There's a country mix to it, but it's almost like the Swedish dance pop version of what an old Taylor Swift song should have sounded like. Although the single's bubblegum pop style divided the critics, fans loved it, and it shot to the top of the charts. The fact that it was her first overall number one is, is kind of perfect in the sense that she hasn't stopped getting better, and it shows that she's still relevant, and she's still growing, and she's still developing. I don't think We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together is as much a new direction for Taylor as maybe it is kind of finishing up an earlier part of her career. While Red saw Swift moving further from her country music styling, she maintained her autobiographical themes and subject matter. Yet the album featured a distinct push towards a more mainstream sound overall, with tracks such as I Knew You Were Trouble, supposedly written about One Direction's Harry Styles, invoking dance pop and even dubstep textures that were thanks in no small part to Taylor's collaboration with many different artists and producers. There's a lot of stuff that will sound very familiar to people. There's a lot of collaboration on it. And it is a little bit more musically diverse, a little bit, a little bit tougher perhaps, you could say, a little bit, a bit harder. It's fearless, updated, with a little bit more swing to it, maybe a bit more of an edge. The interesting arc in her career is the Taylor Swift and the Fearless albums were very much about learning how to do things. Speak Now was the album where she wanted to show that she could do everything herself. All of those songs were written solely by her, and she and Nathan Chapman, who've been working together all along, produced that record. You know, it, was, it was a very small circle of people that created Speak Now. With Fearless, the world kind of opens back up. You know, she goes out on the Speak Now tour and she's performing with different guests in every city. She's doing cover songs related to that city or to that area in every show. And so Red is really kind of a continuation of that spirit of collaboration that she had going on during the tour because she's working with people like Dan Wilson, she's got the stuff with Max Martin and Shellback. There's a duet with Ed Sheeran and Butch Walker. You know, so she's working with different producers, she's working with different songwriters, she's got some guests in on the album, and it's really about seeing what she can learn, seeing what she can do with all of these other people, and, 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 and kind of learning just how broad the Taylor Swift sound is gonna go. Red has stormed the charts around the world, and followed up by 2013's tour, Taylor Swift has found herself to be one of the most successful and focal artists on the planet. She has brought country music to new generations of fans and offered an alternate aspect to modern celebrity. Coming from nothing, the determined teen princess of country is now queen of the music world. If I was a popular culture mogul who wanted to know the hearts and minds of young American women, I would pay real, real close attention to every word that woman says, everything she does, everything she sings, everything she wears. I think Taylor's appeal is that she really is mainstream and she's safe. You know, she's safe for everybody to come to with their families. You don't have to worry about what she's gonna sing about, and she's relatable to all ages. She's shown the world that country music can still produce superstars when it was looking like it couldn't. She's changed Nashville. She's brought the demographic down drastically. 
Nashville is now aware that you can sell country music records to younger people. There was a very strong sense of despair here that maybe country of music was going to go into a terrible decline. And she arrested that, stopped that, and um, gave it a kickstart. And I think it's probably thriving now like it hasn't for a long time. So she's, she's pretty important. I think she is an iconic American gal right now. Maybe the iconic American gal. <laughs>